Hello, my name is Emily Sanderson. I'm from Thomas Hardy, and our research group has been investigating the potential for insect contamination in food in the UK. Um, this idea originated from an article that I read while in the United States, published by their food regulatory body, that outlined acceptable levels of non-harmful contamination in food, such as insect particulates or mold. But when looking in the UK and in the EU, they don't have any regulations of that kind because the contamination is considered not dangerous and is assumed not to be present. However, lots of people would object to having insects in their food, especially if for personal or religious reasons they were vegetarian or vegan. So we decided to see if we could use gel electrophoresis to see if we could detect any insect DNA um, in food samples. Okay. So our genetics club that we run um, provided us with the materials and taught us how to perform PCRs, which is how you replicate wanted samples of DNA so that you can get large enough levels to detect them, and also gel electrophoresis, which involves separating the DNA by length. So you, if you have the sample that you're looking for, it will show up as a band on a gel. And we learned this while searching for Borrelia in ticks, which another group from my school will be talking about in a second. But after that, we can choose our own research project to perform, and so, we decided to look for insects, and this gave us an opportunity to learn how scientific research and lab work is carried out, and also what it's like working as a team of scientists together to try and problem solve and create an experiment. And since we had to gather our own samples and design our own method, because this experiment had never been done before, it was a great lesson in how to design a scientific study that gave the most accurate and reliable results possible given the conditions. So for our project, we first selected um, samples of food that had the highest quantity of insect contamination according to the US guidelines. And that turned out to be five different types of spices. It was marjoram, nutmeg, oregano, sage, and thyme. But because spices are notoriously difficult to get anything to do with because of their chemical activity, we also decided to test flour. And conveniently, there was one particular insect that's most common, commonly found in flower called the granary weevil. So we could select a primer, which is the chemical that, well, a section of DNA that targets the DNA you're looking for so that it can be replicated in PCR that was specific to the granary weevil. For the spices, because we didn't know what insect it would be, we decided to just use two general insect primers that picked up on insect mitochondrial DNA. Um, and then we also tested all of our samples using just a eukaryotic primer so that if we got any negative results, it would be proven that it was because of the absence of insect DNA and not just failure to extract DNA from the sample. Unfortunately, we were unable to obtain any DNA from the spices. It's probably because both their chemically active nature makes it difficult and we could only test very small amounts but the flower samples were much more promising. So if you see in the first picture with the eukaryotic primer, every sample shows a band, which means we got DNA, successfully extracted DNA from all of the samples that we tested. And we did test three different types of flower. We ran one of them twice, which is why there's an extra band, which was plain flour, but we also tested flour from a whole food shop and a mill because those were less processed. And so we had a higher chance of getting DNA from them. But in the second test with the insect primer looking for the granary weevil, the only band we got was in our positive control, which would seem to prove since we did get detectable DNA, but it was negative for any insect primer, that it is unlikely that there was any granary weevil contamination in the samples, which then begs the question why the UK seems to have you know, less of a problem with insect contamination than the US would. It would be good to continue this experiment with larger samples, which is our next goal, but since it was done by a group of year 13s and we'll be leaving school soon, I'm hoping to continue this in university. But that was our project. Thank you. Uh, I said we grow, we grow mealworms at school and we grow them in porridge eggs. And no matter how fresh the porridge eggs are, give it about a month and you will have an infestation. 
we, oh, sorry, I have a microphone. Um, <laughs> we did think of testing other foods. We mainly wanted to stick with the article that we originally found, which is why we chose to look through there for the highest contaminations, because we were directly comparing the countries. And we were also looking more for like industrial regulations of food rather than things that can grow after you buy them. But we did try and obtain most of our like spices and flour from more whole food shops, and we tried to get the organic, you know, non-pesticides one wherever possible. Um, but we also wanted to see, just because not everyone eats whole foods, whether we could also detect it in ordinary foods that lots more people would eat. All right. Just one second to get the microphone across. Hi. Um, do you know what methods the um, US Food Department used to identify the insects in their flour and stuff? We did try and find out, but they didn't actually release how they looked for it. There have been a couple of papers published by the United States, again, the um, Food Regulatory Body, I think it's called the Food and Drug Administration, called the FDA, um, which has been about using real-time PCR to test food samples in preparation, but we were unable to find what techniques that they used. So because this was the technique we were learning, this is the one that we chose. Good, that's reasonable. Okay, I think um, that's fantastic. So thank you very much, Emily. Congratulations. Thank you.